So we're really grateful that you've taken the time, especially at five o'clock, uh, to come online and uh, join this webinar. We're delighted um, to have such amazing speakers again with us today. So we have um, Alistair Forbes, we have Chris Newman, all the way from having his breakfast, I think at the moment in uh, San Francisco. And we have Monique, who is sitting in a rather elaborate chair as well, sitting by the beach, I think. Uh, Sandy from Pentech, and we also have Robert Hig Higginson as well um, from Par Equity. And today, because of his background and all his knowledge around this, Paul is going to um, conduct the fireside chat. So I'm going to hand it over to him. There's not much of a fireside here at the moment. Because it's very, very sunny on my balcony. Um, but uh, imagine there is a fireside behind me. And uh, we've got some great speakers this afternoon. Thanks, Jude. Um, uh, I can't remember, this is the 12th webinar or something we've, we've done. And this is the first one in a fireside chat mode. I've given up because it's like having a six month old child and then not knowing how many months after the six months. So, Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a slightly different format this afternoon because uh, uh, our panellists and speakers will be able to butt in at any time and add their own bit to it or even tell a few jokes and stories if they want to. It's uh, very informal. I think we should maybe just start off <clears throat> with our guests introducing themselves and uh, I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, Robert, give me your kind of transatlantic divide between uh, Cramond and the West Coast. Do you want to go first? Sure. So, um, hi everybody, I'm Robert Higginson, um, co-founder along with Paul of Power Equity. Been working together uh, for the last, well, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, I, as Paul said, live between the United States and the United Kingdom, mostly around Edinburgh and London. Um, in the US between Boston and um, on the Bay Area. Um, my background is sort of software, hardware development, comms engineer in the early stage before I got into, uh, into the finance side. Um, I'm very much seduced by transformatory technology. Um, and in uh, terms of my focus these days, very much around digital health technology and building this so-called transatlantic bridge between the UK and the US. Um, so that's kind of me, Paul. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Uh, maybe Monique, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Monique Woodard. I'm based in San Francisco. Uh, I'm an early stage investor, formerly at 500 Startups, also Scout for Lightspeed, Venture Partners. Um, and I uh, invest in a lot of consumer tech companies, but also um, some B2B and enterprise. And I'm very excited to meet you all. Thanks, Money. Uh, Sandy, you want to go next? Sure, Paul. Hi, folks. Um, I'm Sandy McKinnon. I'm a partner with uh, Pentech Ventures. We we're an early stage uh, investor in the UK, um, investing in software companies, typically B2B um, kind of companies and enterprise software companies. I've uh, been doing this for a long time, um, but uh, uh, and we are still open for business, but uh, it's definitely not business as usual at the moment. So look forward to hearing what everybody else has say, got to say. Yeah, it sounds like you're setting the scene for my first question there, Sandy. Thanks for that. Chris, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Chris Newman. I'm a recovering founder, recovering uh, investor, recovering from a lot of things. Um, I spent about 15 years in the data machine learning infrastructure space, part of a number of startups, uh, two of which were VC founded and had exits that uh, didn't suck. Uh, then spent a few years at 500 startups running their AI practice with Monique. Uh, and now I run an organization called Commonwealth Ventures, which works with governments and corporations, primarily in the UK and Canada, to help entrepreneurs there better connect with the Silicon Valley. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And Alistair, last but not least, Alistair, what about you? Thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, Alistair Forbes, um, most of my career has been in the software industry, um, in early stage and scale up uh, companies. Um, I've been active as an angel investor for a few years, not least through the, the Power Syndicate, and um, most recently spent a couple of years working in a um, VC firm, uh, Mercy Technologies, which is an early stage tech investor in the UK, doing C to Series A stage investments. Yeah, thanks, Alistair. So, right, uh, business as usual. Robert, business as usual, what does that mean to Power Equity, business as usual? 
Um, well, it's not as usual. I think we've stepped up, really. We're, I think, probably busier than ever. Um, I don't think, uh, from an operational perspective, we've kind of skipped a beat uh, from our perspective. We are probably seeing um, certainly uh, more deals come in than we probably had before, but we have been a little bit more, um, I suppose, uh, considered about um, the details of those deals, particularly around uh, the runway of sales that those companies are projected, uh, projecting the uh, sectors they're in um, and their ability to actually close rounds. Um, I think in-flight deals for us, uh, things that we had pre-C19 are, um, uh, you know, are really going well, um, both on both sides of the Atlantic, stuff we've been doing here and stuff we've been doing transatlantic. Um, I think the difficulty is when people are coming in with new deals, um, because investors are a little bit uh, more suspect of them. Um, so if you've got an in-flight deal, I think you shouldn't have so much of an issue, but something in, in, in a new deal format where you're starting a brand new transaction is probably going to take you a lot longer. Um, if you're in certain sectors, um, you know, for example, if you're in the entertainment business hospitality sector, you've got a serious problem. Um, so that's, that's what I see um, from our side. It's pretty intense. Um, but it's, uh, we're doing reasonably well, and I think some of our companies are doing quite well closing rounds. Yeah, I think I, think I should ask one of our transatlantic uh, colleagues next. Uh, Chris, you want to go next and uh, talk about business unusual in, uh, in California? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's obviously it's not uh, business as usual, and, and I actually just got off a... a Creative Destruction Lab meeting with a number of uh, investors in, in the UK and in the US. Um, I think what we're seeing broadly, and Monique can speak to this as well, is there's very little happening that wasn't already in flight. Um, you know, we're starting to see a couple of deals, you know, a few folks claiming that they've done deals with folks that they've never met. Uh, but I think realistically, those are few and far between. And most of the uh, VCs, and I can only speak for the folks in, in California, but uh, most of them who are making claims of open for business and we're still doing deals, you know, they, the truth is very far from that. Um, so when I'm spot speaking with founders right now about fundraising, it's look, if you're in practice, close it now. You know, if you've got a fundraising round in, in, uh, in flight, uh, you're probably going to take a little bit of a haircut on the valuation, right? Those are, those are being adjusted right now. Um, but if you haven't started fundraising, unless you're in a particular area where there is high demand um, or you're really very pre-seed in an area where, where checks are still getting, getting cut, um, you know, you really need to think about how can you survive if you're not able to substantially raise in the next, you know, let's call it six to nine months. Uh, interesting. Monique, uh, uh, do you have a, yeah, you have a slightly... I, uh, yeah. I would say, here's how I think about the breakdown. If you are raising anywhere from friends and family to, um, you know, a proper institutional seed round, I'm seeing some of, a lot of those get done um, without, you know, the, uh, the partners at the fund and the entrepreneur actually meeting each other in person. As you move up the stack, it gets a little mm. harder. So, Pre-seed, you can get it done. Seed, you'll probably get it done. Series A, um, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult, right? If you're raising Series A plus, um, those, those funds are really taking a lot more time and really understand, trying to understand where valuations are headed before they jump into a new Series A, Series B, Series C deal. If you're talking about growth stage firms, where their uh, time to you know an exit is much shorter, where they're looking at how quickly are you going to um, you know go public or or file for an IPO, those are almost all um, sort of uh, at a standstill because just the time to IPO is so short, and we have no clarity on where valuations will end up. Well, yeah, over here we've been listening to uh, Donald's uh, uh, interesting statements recently, and uh, I think Alistair and Sandy are, uh, are dying to wonder whether we should be investing in a disinfectant company. Yeah, exactly. That's all here. Sandy? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, we've, as, from a business as usual um, perspective for us, without the debt all, 
um, you know, we're uh, uh, we are we're talking to an awful lot of people, and 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 we talk to a lot of VCs as well, and up and down the UK. Um, I think there is a general kind of feeling that most VCs won't make cut checks uh, for people they haven't met in person. Um, I think it's going to be again few and far between any deals that get done. Um, that doesn't mean to say that we're not building a, a, a kind of stockpile of people that we're really desperate to meet um, uh, to see, uh, uh, you know, what we can do in terms of uh, uh, progressing stuff. And I think, you know, there's again chatting with some of my colleagues up and down the UK. There's a kind of feeling that, you know, there's an argument. Who knows when, you know, all the lockdown will stop in the UK. But, you know, if there's a situation where, you know, we can actually with I hate the term social distancing, but personal distancing. Um, if there's a, a way of doing personal distancing um, that uh, that you can start taking meetings, maybe in June, like July, um, then you you know you could see how deals could start getting done again. Um, mm. uh, but at the moment, until we're actually starting to meet people, I think it's going to be super hard to get anything away that's not in flight, as you say already. And even yeah. there, it will come with wobbles. It will come with valuation sucky teeth. And we are seeing, you know, we've seen yeah, somebody try to pull the, the rug out of uh, uh, underneath us already in one round that did get away in the end. Um, and it was the, the, the restorative medicine wasn't too bad that the, the poor founder had to take. Um, so, you know, we, it, it's, it's uh, but, but to your point on should we all be investing in debt all, I mean, I think that, you know, Mark and Dreesen put a, a pretty uh, a punchy thing about building stuff. Um, and I do think there is an opportunity to do some interesting stuff. Not everybody needs to jump on the COVID bandwagon, but I think, you know, we've all seen remote working tools kind of have to become good at, uh, in flight. Um, and so there are some other parts of the, 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 you know, disruption that can be, can be looked at, I think, with a new lens. So, yeah, we're having fun, but it's hard. Uh, yeah, just for Monique and uh, Chris, Suki teeth is a Scottish expression, just so you know. Yeah, go. Uh, <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not drinking. I'm drinking a Californian IPA for in solidarity with the. Uh... Excellent, excellent, Alistair. You're on mute. You're on mute, Alistair. Sorry about that. I think just building on uh, what some of the people have been saying, you know, there's no question that. Deal volumes are going down. Um, you know, to this point about business as usual, there was a fairly provocative quote on Twitter a little while back saying that anybody who says it's business as usual is either lying or stupid, and you probably don't want them on your cap table. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, if you if you look at um, you know the macro situation, if you look at what happened post 2008, for example, um, you know the valuations and round sizes went down by you know anything between 15 and 40 percent, and it took four years to come back. Um, obviously, it's no guarantee it's going to be the same this time, but this is going to be a long haul for sure. I think for people who, who are looking for funding, um, you know, the way that they present their case for funding is going to have to be different. Um, you know, the, there was always the challenge for founders of if you come in with a really aggressive plan, uh, investors will say, I'm eh, not sure you're going to deliver that. If you come with a conservative plan, they'll say, well, it's not ambitious enough. Um, but I think, you know, things are definitely moving towards the conservative end of the spectrum. So, yeah, we'd love to see you achieve those, those ambitious targets. But tell me what happens if you don't, because it's such a fluid situation. Um, it's really hard to know how businesses are going to perform. And therefore, having, you know, your, your kind of base case, but also what happens if you don't quite hit that is going to be important. I think the final thing I'd say at this point is just that it's really important for funders to understand the nature of investor that they're talking to. So if you take the UK situation, for example, um, we had one of the previous sessions, we had some, uh, someone from British Business Bank on saying that, you know, they're really encouraging the funds in which they have money to continue to invest. So, you know, I think anybody who's got a um, significant part of their fund that's come from public sector sources will be getting quite a lot of pressure to keep investing. Whereas others are going to take a much more conservative view. So, you know, people have got private capital behind them, I think, as, as most of the other speakers have said, are going to be taking their time and they're not going to be rushing into things. So doing a bit of research in terms of who you're talking to and, and the nature of their funds is going to be important as well. Yeah, so we're getting lots of questions in the background. Maybe, Jude, maybe you could uh, 
help me out and you pick up the chat and the Q and A stuff. And uh, I think there's an interesting question there from uh, Peter Proud uh, Cortex on a on kind of note around business as usual. Uh, and basically, Peter's asking um, if somebody uh, has got a properly architected digital business, uh, should it be business as usual, or what should be what should they be doing? Uh, who'd like to take that? Maybe, maybe well, our US colleagues, Monique, Chris? So yeah, I think uh, Peter is making the point that for online businesses, it should be business as usual. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I think there are lots of online businesses who had strong foundations and strong fundamentals where you know the fact that parents are at home trying to homeschool kids, um, they're uncertain about you know paychecks. We've seen largest uh, filings for unemployment than we've seen ever in the United States. Um, you know all of these sorts of things make it absolutely um, absolutely the case that even properly architected businesses are seeing some are often seeing some level of downturn or just you know general uncertainty about the future. So. I, I think properly, properly architected or not, we're not seeing business as usual. And you know, I want to make the point that we've been in ten years of a bull market, and so the expectations that we've that we've come to expect over the last ten years have been shot out of the water. And we have to readjust to this new normal of whatever it is, and see how it will change over the next few months. Um, but I wouldn't expect it to be the same as it has been for the next for the for the previous ten years, for sure. Yeah, Monique, that's quite a good insight. I think um, the new normal, uh, the new normal is still being worked out, obviously. But uh, yeah, I kind of agree with that completely. I think even people who, are, who have got great online digital businesses, their downstream customers are going to be massively affected unless they're in some completely impervious business, but most aren't. Um, yeah, and it's, and, it's uh, um, and in terms of availability of capital, I wonder what that's like it, it, oh, where, oh, where you are, money, Chris, versus UK. The European estimate, uh, which I'm sure Sandy and the guys will back up, is a company called Bohurst that is the main analyst for venture capital in Europe. And they reckon that 60% of the uh, VC capital is, is either parked or on the sidelines at the moment. So you're down to 40% uh, liquidity, really. And what's it like over there? Chris, you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. And, and first I want to echo uh, what Monique said and sort of um, parlay that into an answer to your question, which is, um, you know, we still haven't seen the second order effects of what's going on. And I think it's really important for people to realize that. Uh, Monique referenced some of the unemployment numbers that are coming in. We haven't yet seen the impact of those unemployment numbers on consumer purchases and paying rent and some of these other things. Um, it's also helpful to, to remember that the last time we had uh, a major recession, 2008, 2009, founders under 30 were still in high school. Founders under 35 were likely in uni. So there's a huge swath of folks who are running businesses right now who've never seen a down market. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, in, in my conversations with investors, a lot of the money is parked. Uh, and it's not that they don't intend to deploy it. So I think one helpful thing for founders to remember is there's an incredible amount of dry powder uh, in the coffers of, of venture capitalists. And that's dry powder that does, based on their LPAs, have to be deployed. So there's a huge amount of money available. But many of the VCs, once they get through making sure their portfolio companies are okay, they're waiting to develop a thesis of, okay, what are the second and third order effects going to be, right? We know people are using more, you know, Zoom, right? We're all on this call. We know folks are doing more remote stuff. What does it look like when we start to get back to whatever the new normal is? And what is our investment thesis going to be around that, right? Um, we also know from 2008 and from before that, the, the dot-com crush, that incredible companies come out of challenging times like this. So investors are, at the one hand, they're pulling back, but they're also really eager to start, you know, investing capital. And uh, one of the conversations I had this morning was a, a report that 
uh, and I don't know the numbers behind this, but an incredible number of early stage Canadian investors are starting to deploy more capital uh, because they're already starting to, to develop theses around that. Yeah, that's kind of really interesting. Um, I, I saw a statistic that said there was, uh, and this is private equity rather than venture capital, that something like two and a half trillion dollars sitting in PE firms undeployed at the moment because a lot of them are just, have just raised uh, and, and they're going, well, we're going to wait. And, and it, to your point, Chris, we've got to wait and see what the, uh, the thesis is from here. Uh, Paul, I think, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm always a fan of kind of value chain analysis of, you know, what is your customer and your customer's customer. Do? And but I think actually now more than ever, you, like having a, a mental model for that in terms of what your own business does, is, is super important and being able to express that as a kind of coherent narrative, is super important. I mean, like, you know, so if you're like selling something into the insurance market for insurers to be more, you know, what's the insurance market going to be like, you know, what are the SMBs or whomever that the insurers are, you know, insurers always want to sell more insurance, but they're not going to be except, et cetera. So I think actually looking at that value chain, um, there are some, I think some relatively big, uh, discontinuity is happening at the moment. So you look at retail other than, you know, food coming to your house. I mean, it's, it's kind of stopped at the moment, you know, like, so how that's going to like pick itself back up and will a circular economy be, be, be playing into that much more than, than we had been. So, you know, like if COVID is, has kickstarted everyone's digital transformation, what does that actually look like in one, two years time? Um, uh, so, but we, I mean, we're, I, now is a good time for reflection. You know, I probably spent half my time traveling before this. Now I've got half my time back to, to start thinking about this kind of stuff. So, um, and, and you, you know, you road test this talking to folks like yourselves in this and also other founders. But uh, um, I do think that there's always the old adage as well. You know, I've got, you, you and I are old enough to have come through, you know, two existential crises of, of, of uh, the dot-com and 2008 and 2004 wasn't too great either. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, the, 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 the kind of old adage of the best companies will always find a way and find money somehow, I, I think still, still is true. Um, but, but that doesn't make it easy for people that are struggling. I just, you know, but, uh, and for me, value, value chain analysis is a, a super good thing if you've got any reflective time. Yeah, that's, that's great, think, um, great input. Great input, Sandy. Alistair? Yeah, I, I think just kind of picking up on Sandy's point and also on uh, Chris's point, you know, there's lots of examples of really great companies that have flourished in a downturn. Um, and I think now is the time when the really good founders come to the fore because, you know, they're thinking ahead, they're planning ahead. So, you know, to your point, Sandy, you know, they're looking at how their industry is changing you know, is there a new opportunity that they can tap into? Or actually, do they need to pivot to somewhere else completely? But doing that in a way that's thoughtful and they can explain to an investor why they're doing that, it's not just an act of desperation. Um, so I think, you know, the really good founders come to the fore at this stage. Um, and absolutely, you know, great companies will get funded. Um, you know, I think it, it came up earlier in the call as well. Um, you know, the bar is getting higher. So the ones that can clear the bar are still going to get funded, um, but it's going to be harder to clear the bar, I think. Thanks, Alistair. How are we doing on questions, Jude? Uh, Robert has answered a few. There's also one from Tom Morton here um, saying, what is the appetite for acquisition? Acquis <laughs> Friday afternoon. Uh, i water. <laughs> just so you know, Jude's not even started drinking yet. It's just water. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So what is the appetite for, for acquisitions? Yeah. Yeah. So M&A &M &A situation. Um, Robert, do you want to pick that up and, and give your view, transatlantic view? Uh, the, the Crammon, California view? Yeah. Just, just think about that. <clears throat> I wasn't quite sure what that question meant because it said talking about acquisitive growth strategy. Um, so yeah. acquisitive and growth. I wasn't entirely sure it was just acquisitions, but assuming it is, um, I mean, I certainly think there are, we're in, I guess, uh, two or three different processes right now. And although they're always slow and continue to be slow, they've not fallen off a cliff. I think, you know, as other 
speakers have, have said along the, you know, the last few minutes, you know, good companies will always get funded and good companies that in, have transactions in flight um, shouldn't unwind um, unless, for example, they are in one of these really unfortunate sectors, um, which um, as a whole we, we, we're not exposed to. Um, so I don't see any reason why some of the companies that we've got that are having those transactions would, would slow up. Um, I think it just depends on you know, which sector you are and at which part of the process you're actually at. Mm. One of the great um, questions I'm putting the question. I think, oh. I think if you've got the money on your balance sheet and you can afford it, this is going to be a good time to pick up some companies um, who you know, have good businesses, good business fundamentals, but might be struggling to raise that next round. Um, so I think there will be some good interesting acquisitions and growth that comes from acquisitions. But I would also caution um, companies to not go out and, and acquire just because there is a great deal on the table, um, to really think about where that company fits into their, their overall roadmap, and to also make sure they really have enough money. <laughs> make sure you have enough money to both acquire, run, and still run your existing business. Because um, you know, acquisition isn't just the cost of the acquisition, it's actually the cost of like acquiring, integrating, continuing to run, you know, both businesses. So do it. But yeah, be you careful. Got, yeah that's, that's great counsel, Monique. I think, you, I think if you're going to acquire a company, you've got to be really clear where the synergy benefits are, and then you've got to execute on the synergy benefits. It's not enough knowing what they are, you've then got to do the synergy benefits afterwards. So that means cutting people, cutting officers, or whatever, you've got to do that. Uh, uh, I, that was, I bought a company in recruitment center, which we're going to go on this evening, but uh, we learned that lesson. Um, uh, good acquisition ultimately, but we didn't generate enough synergy benefits quickly enough. Is I mean, it, company was, go on ahead. I said there's another question in from Abby Hertz. You got huh? that one. Um, sorry, no. Mr. Start. Maybe this has been covered already. What type of business do you think there will be more appetite to invest in? Um, brackets productivity enhancing software or immersive communication platforms maybe similarly is there anything that would previously have been hot that's not that's now not that's not now and in answering Peter Proud I have put my teeth back in thank you <laughs> yeah that's good so, so just slightly reframing the question but still answering the question yeah. uh, I think uh, I think everyone on the panel thinks there's going to be a new norm uh, and, and, and what's going to be um, fashionable to take forward in the future as great investments is going to change somewhat. And so I think the question, I'll reframe the question as, so what, so what businesses or sectors are going to be interesting to invest in post-COVID? Who wants to take that? Alistair? Yeah, I think um, there will be um, marked difference between the sectors. We've seen that already, obviously. Um, I think um, running across all of the sectors, there's been a marked change in the value propositions that appeal. So uh, solutions that will save companies money are going to be particularly attractive right now across every sector. Um, whereas, you know, if you go back pre the current situation, companies were investors were looking a lot more at companies that would um, help revenue growth for their customers. So I think that that's certainly going to be a change. So, um, you know, if you already have that kind of value proposition, then great. Um, but if not, I think quite a lot of companies can reframe their value proposition in a way that is, it's a cost saving. So um, I think if they can do, you know, put messaging out about do more with less and, you know, how do you get the, the best out of the team you've got and all that, as opposed to messaging that's more about, um, we can help you grow your top line because, you know, everybody's expectations is that that's going to be a lot harder than it would have been before. Um, so I think there's both a, a horizontal and a vertical element to that, if you like. Um, I think, you know, there's probably going to be less of an appetite for um, sectors that were, were probably viewed as being further out. Um, I think people are going to look for shorter term uh, validation of, of companies. So if you've got something that is going to take two or three years to get to market, um, you know, that's going to be harder to raise money. But again, that's sector dependent because, you know, if you look at, uh, life sciences type companies, you know, that, that's typically a longer term play anyway. So that may be less effective because I think life sciences investors are used to the fact that it takes longer to get to any kind of revenue 
Um, I and mean, obviously, Robert, this is very much your area of interest. So um, you know, you've probably got some perspective on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I was not going to bore the, uh, the audience with uh, digital health uh, as I bore their partners every day for, by it. Uh, so perhaps I'll leave that aside. But so, so certainly... I've just got to go just now and, and <laughs> put my glass up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> certainly anything that is, um, you know, we see some really interesting businesses really who are secondary uh, care sector uh, businesses are pushing patients, uh, literally, almost literally, out of the door uh, to try and keep them uh, away from hospital. And so the whole area of um, digital uh, health technologies um, for remote diagnostics, um, obviously telehealth, et cetera, was interesting before, but I think everybody's now really got the message that you can't keep people in hospital and you need to keep them at distance for lots of reasons to take care of uh, an aging community. And, and uh, of course, that everybody now knows there's probably going to be another pandemic pretty soon. So this isn't this is this new world we're going to live in. Um, but the two areas, Paul, that I was going to mention, uh, I think we signaled to the market really early on in the year that we were interested in. And I know this isn't shared by everybody um, is uh, the area of transport. I think there's a huge amount being done by the big boys that are obviously sitting the other side of the pond to where I am at the moment in the in the in the Bay Area in terms of um, you know, uh, transport systems and, uh, and obviously everything from roads that are snarled up uh, to deliveries, aerial deliveries of not only things like medicines, but also products. We've obviously seen our reliance on that, um, getting your everything from your food to your new laptop to whatever it might well be delivered to your door. I think there's still a huge amount of that going to grow in terms of transport and logistics. And people have seen the importance of it now um, Obviously, all the aerial transport stuff that's being done uh, by Uber, it, you know, is, is obviously the big boys are in it. But I think there's still room for the small guys to innovate. Uh, the other one, almost to your, uh, to your audience's point earlier on about cyber, and we're still really interested in cyber. We've not really done any cyber deals. Um, you know, obviously, we, we missed one earlier on, uh, so two or three years ago, which is sold uh, reasonably well here in Scotland. Um, but as we've seen uh, with Zoom, you can learn some really hard lessons by not getting your cyber security kind of sorted out. So I think there is interesting work to be done in that area too. And those are kind of three sectors that you know, we're looking at, uh, whole telehealth, cyber and transport. Interesting. So I was gonna wheel back slightly to uh, something Chris said earlier about uh, um, investors still developing their thesis for the next wave. Chris, I don't know whether you've got any reflections on, uh, going back to my, what's going to be in fashion uh, going forward uh, and whether the, your thesis is further, far enough along yet, but uh, perhaps you'd like to think about, you know, have you got any comments on where the fashion's going to be? Well, for, first of all, I'll, I'll echo what, uh, what Robert just said regarding telemedicine. Um, you know, telemedicine has sort of been one of those things that it's just around the corner for a while, you know, almost 10 years now. It's, it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come this is unequivocally the thing that pushes it into the mainstream. Um, in the US, we've seen the suspension of HIPAA, which is the uh, regulatory um, you know, laws around uh, data security completely as it relates to telemedicine. So overnight, uh, doctors went from having to use a HIPAA compliant uh, sort of hard to use uh, video conferencing software to being legally able to see patients over FaceTime or Zoom or anything like that. Um, so that's gonna be a massive, massive one. Uh, that's sort of an obvious uh, area. I think some of them, and, and I may throw this over to Monique. Monique does a lot of investing based on demographic changes. One of the things that I think is gonna be really interesting coming out of this is what is the impact of the huge percentage of the population that up until now didn't engage in online uh, retail, didn't engage in a lot of these tools. Literally overnight, you have the entirety of the population suddenly having to figure out how do I buy things online? How do I use video conferencing, right? This massive shift in adoption that I can't even think of a, a comparison for in the, in the age of software. And I think that's gonna have some incredible Incredible impacts that I can't even, you know, fathom. Yeah, yeah as, as a consumer on, investor and consumer researcher, I feel like this is a really exciting time because um, 
there's the forcing function of everyone having to stay in their homes, retail being closed. I think this is this could be the nail in the coffin for a lot of our major retailers. Um, you know, you see, uh, I think Nord is it Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus just filed for bankruptcy. Uh, Neiman um, Marcus. Yeah, Neiman Marcus. Thank you. Um, so Neiman's just filed for bankruptcy, but you're seeing a huge uptick in people being willing to do so many different things online that they weren't willing to do before, from ordering groceries to buying, um, you know, consuming, uh, needing to see their doctor and using healthcare to, um, you know, just buying normal things that they don't find on Amazon. So I think it's a really interesting time for consumers coming online and actually having to make those transact transactions entirely um, via online online channels. And I also think that, um, you know, it's also going to force a lot of previous brick and mortar businesses into an online business. And so there's a lot of, you know, back in B2B and SaaS opportunity that lies there. Yeah, interesting. Sandy, what's Pentec up to with the fashion then? What's going on at Pentec? Fashion? No, not a lot, as you can see. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I mean, like, so things like, uh, the, well, the last company, the company I'm on the board of and we've just closed around is a company called LifeBit. Um, and LifeBit are in that kind of engineering of biology space. Um, and so that, you know, that's a, you know, as you know, like everything we'll invest in, I would have loved to look to have had looked at Chris's companies back in the day before he sold them Aster. But uh, um, you know, we, we we were doing big data companies before people was calling it big data. It was thank God it's now called data again. Um, you know, we were investing in machine learning companies before everybody learned how to do linear regression. Um, we you know we we. We were we, we always try to like look at stuff that's that's a bit harder and I see Peter's put a, a comment in about patience with enterprise software. So we we've got kind of like you know, we've got the scars of you know having to run kind of enterprise sales teams and 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 their own companies etc. So you know I think we've got a lot of patience, but I also think that you can build a lot of stuff that's really quite complex and hard with pretty small teams. You don't need massive casts mm. of thousands to to build really quite disruptive and elegant stuff. Um, now there, there are clearly cases in point that you do need that, but there are other ways of doing it and, and keeping the kind of the, the sizes down. But I completely agree with Peter, you know, like and ever uh, more now, I mean, cash is absolutely king. So really understanding how much you're spending your OPEX, I think is really important. I mean, we're looking at, you know, we, I think, you know, doing yet another telemedicine thing isn't something we're gonna do. Um, uh, but you know, there's, there's, we are looking to see where could there be actual real disruption. Now, there's a bunch of stuff like we don't invest in hardware companies or where there's a, a strong dependence on novel hardware. But you know, there's if you look at the kind of wearable self and the quantitative self, um, and you know, a lot of the kind of uh, digital biomarkers that are starting to come from various types of uh, digital effluent coming from us. Um, there's some really interesting things that are starting to be. Um, uh, understood about your health, about you know society, about air quality, about et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's there are lots of kind of opportunities in and around again making better use of data. So we I think we're kind of uh, st relatively stage agnostic. I mean the latest we will do is a Series A um, from the fund at the moment. It's a 90 million pound fund. Uh, we've made 13 investments out of this fund three. Um, but we've got a predisposition to kind of, you know, enterprise hard stuff um, that people are doing because, and, and cyber, we've invested in a bunch of security companies over the years and, and cyber, you know, is a bellwether, you know, is, is, but the, you know, the internet is not well secured at the moment, but it's not going to change anytime soon. Um, so you need to find your angle to come into it. So, uh, yeah, so, so I keep sales team to a minimum. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and until in such times as you've properly got product market fit, um, or you can get enough signal. So anyway, but, but as a non-answer, we're we're kind of op focused opportunism is how I would kind of frame what we've done over the last kind of twenty years. You know, we 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 kind of follow sectors and actually have quite deep understandings of market kind of movements. Um, but uh, I think where we we are like everybody else trying to spot the kind of category defining 
um, kind of breakthrough company, which by definition isn't doing the same as another 10 companies. So it is quite, it's, it's, it's great fun and it's a great privilege to, to see, uh, you know, entrepreneurs' dreams day in, day out. I love it. I, um, but uh, um, yeah, that's a non-answer, Paul. We're still investing in software companies. Thanks, Andy. I was, I was, uh, uh, no, nobody else would know this on the call, but I was, uh, I was an LP in Sandy's first fund back in the day. Was that 2001 or something? 2001, Paul. Yeah. Um, Paul, there's another question just here from, um, I'll have to, from uh, Raj Merrick. Hi, everyone. Curious on what Monique mentioned about brick and mortar looking at SaaS. Would you mind expanding, please? Monique? Sure. I think, you know, now as a lot of brick and mortar stores are finding that they can't do business because they don't have a physical location, they're now trying to move online very rapidly and very quickly. Um, so obviously Shopify is going to be a huge winner of a lot of that business, but there are, there are a lot of other opportunities to um, provide uh, software and technology that those businesses wouldn't have had to use before. So you don't have a storefront anymore, how are you acquiring customers? How are you managing inventory? How are you, uh, how are you managing customer communication? All of those sorts of things are, are areas where a SaaS business could, could put together either you know, a very broad business or a verticalized business. Is that very clear? Does that answer the question? No response back, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. <laughs> I, I've got a couple more questions, then I suggest we go on to the Q&A bit, um, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, my question is more about a transatlantic thing. Um, uh, if a company is looking for a Series A financing round and they can't find the right partner locally, should they be thinking transatlantic? As in, if there's a company in Scotland uh, can't, can't get the support here locally, should it be thinking of going, up, going over the pond to find something and vice versa? Maybe, maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, we spend a lot of time with UK companies uh, talking to them about, about where to go. Um, broadly, I would say in any geography, you have to have a reason to go there, right? So, you know, if we're talking about series B and series C and later, that's mostly based on business fundamentals and you can go anywhere and find investors anywhere. At the earlier stage, if you're not doing any business in the US, if you don't have connections in the US, it's going to be very hard for you to raise money because any investor here will just go, well, why couldn't you raise at home? Right? Uh, why weren't you, why did all of the, the local investors say, no, they must know something we don't. Um, now it's true that there's different investment theses between different regions. So when I talk to founders in smaller markets, it's less about, Hey, should you go from Edinburgh and then suddenly go to San Francisco? But it's, hey, look, if there's, there's nobody who's jiving with you in, in Scotland, go to the UK, go to France, go to Germany, right? Regionally, you're more likely to find investors who are um, open to your sales successes, who recognize your customer logos, who are willing to give that next tranche of capital before you sort of travel halfway around the world uh, in search of a holy grail. Sandy, I thought you might have an opinion on this because you've got investing quite a lot of companies have gone transatlantic, right? Yeah, but I, I mean, Chris has hit it completely on, on the head. I mean, if you're not doing business there, then there's no point talking to anybody. And similarly, we've in the past like, invested with uh, Japanese, company, uh, Japanese investors, but the company was doing business in Japan. Um, with LifeBit, you know, we, had, we ended up with five term sheets for LifeBit, all European investors, none from London. 65 uh, investors we pitched. Didn't pitch anybody from the States, um, but uh, um, we ended up with, uh, but we are doing business. And, and again, to the logo recognition, the kind of currency of uh, the relevance of the company made sense in the European context. So I completely, completely agree with Chris. If you're not, if you, you know, you would be, you know, that said, if you've, if you've got no customers in Scotland, you might as well try and get customers in San Francisco. You know, if you're going to go over there, try and do business. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Andy. Uh, 
Jude, would you mind taking control for a second? Uh, first world problems of uh, the lockdown. Somebody's at my door. <laughs> <laughs> His buds been delivered from Craigie Farm, probably. Um, okay, we can we can. Use, there's another question as well that uh, we from Alex Burks, and it says, does the panel believe that? the post-COVID-19 landscape will significantly differ between geographies, UK, rest of the EU, US, China, for example, or do the follow-on effects, will they be coherent across landscapes? Um, believe, I don't know what that means, believe the follow-on effects? So I presume it's just, yeah, a reframe us, do they follow the effects or will they be coherent across landscapes? Robert? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but have a go. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the, the thing is that it's not going to be a switch. I mean, I'm not an expert by a long, long, long way, but it's not, I don't believe this C-19 thing is going to be a switch. Um, you know, we heard uh, obviously in Britain this morning, radio um, talking about the different regions of the UK um, unlocking, let's call it that way, a different sort of speeds. Um, and so I think it is going to be gradual. And so therefore, I think this is going to be a long protracted, uh, process of unlocking and uh, and I think a lot of that's clearly going to be driven uh, by you know things like tests being available for, for folk to have etc cetera, etc cetera. in the United States obviously it's always more in my experience anyway it's very very much more volatile in the United States especially you know obviously in the current leadership as well um, and so things are going to be very very different there and very hard to navigate Linking back to the other question, obviously that just makes things far, far more worse. But I think generally speaking, things will never be the same um, in a post COVID-19. So when we, you know, in a, in a year or so, when we look back at this period, um, and I think to some extent, business will be the better for it um, in terms of people being more efficient, uh, people perhaps not thinking they have to travel quite so much physically. Um, and um, I think we will be more effective for, for that. From a societal point of view, I'm not so sure. I think it really depends how we gradually come out of this sort of uh, this crisis. Um, and uh, if we come out of it nice and smoothly, or if it does uh, start to become a bit of a traffic accident. So I, I'm not entirely sure if I understood the question, but my take in summary would be, it's gonna be a slow gradual process, which we probably won't know when we're really out of it, and that things will not ever be the same. Yeah, I kind of I've, I have a lot of sympathy towards that. What, what do you think, Alistair? I think there have always been regional differences, and I don't think that's going to change. Um, you know, so there are certain fundamental things that are not going to change. So, you know, in the US, you've got a market of 300 plus million people, you know, primarily all speak the same language. Of course, there are regional differences. Of course, if you look at Europe, it's a much more diverse picture. So those are, are structural, and they're not going to change. Um, I think there will be things that are... Uh, having an impact across all geographies. Um, so um, there's just the points that have been made earlier about you know how people are going to work and what the expectations are around how people are going to transact. Is there going to be a lot more online? I think those will be across all geographies. Um, so I don't think it's going to be either you know homogeneous or completely different. Um, which again is you know, <laughs> not sure quite what the intent behind the question was, but um, He's got, I, I think Alex has come back in and said that. Hmm. The question was around will the follow-on effects of COVID-19 be coherent across geographies that sorry there was a typo well it looks like it looks like there's a race to see who can open quickest um, because there's the, the the economy stupid you know so there's 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 a, there's a lot of pressure on people getting economies back and running I mean if you look at the public markets at the moment which are just incredible I mean it's like uh, you know irrational m markets I mean for goodness sake I mean yeah, how could, uh, uh, there was one point, you know, my pension was about 30% down. It looks like it's all back up again. I mean, how does that happen in the current markets? And with all the, as Monique was talking about, um, unemployment and the second and third order effects that, that Chris was chatting about, um, you know, the, the, the public markets, I don't think, are pricing in anything like the, the, the shock to the system at the moment that, that, that we're seeing. Um, but I do think that, you know, I mean, who knows about herd, herd immunity? I mean, it sounds like, you know, until we get a, until we get a vaccine for this, um, we're going to, it's not going to be business as usual. Um, and anybody, and, and other than that, 
we're going to have to make societally big decisions that that we're we're willing to take the kind of you know calculus of death that actually a few deaths are worth it and that feels like i don't think we're there as a as a society yet certainly not in scotland maybe not in the uk um and i don't think the states really wants that either um so i think i think i think you know if china shows that it can unlock and bounce back quicker i think there'll be a lot of uh maneuvering to try to to spin stuff up arguably too quickly and then when the next wave and the next wave and the next wave comes you know we'll get more and more shocks to the system so i I mean there's there's a way of reading it really really badly i think but i also think that uh you know we're there will be different pace people will try to move at different paces to, to what alistair was saying you know there are just bigger markets that move quicker there's more money can be de- deployed quicker um but uh yeah tomorrow will happen i think to that point yeah. Andy, you know if you look at the if you look at the curves of death rates um and you know you mentioned china bouncing back quickly um it's really very pronounced that you know if you look at most of the curves they're tracking pretty much the same trajectory but china was different um you know and when they went into lockdown, they really went into lockdown. I mean, it's much more severe than almost any other country. So the death rate dropped much more dramatically there. So, you know, within six weeks, you know, 85% of their production is back online. But I think that's a consequence of the draconian measures that they put in place that most other countries have not been prepared to do. So if you look at the, the progression curves of most countries, you know, the, the uh, decline in death rates is a lot, lot slower. I think you're exactly right that, you know, there are going to be at least some countries that start relaxing these um, restrictions and find they're going to have to start reimposing them. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's not a linear progression by any means. I've got kind of an economic question. Thanks, Alistair. I've got an economic question for, for maybe uh, Chris and Monique. So what about the oil price then? Minus $34 crude. So negative $34 at the start of the week. What does that mean for us all? I, I don't pretend to have spent nearly enough time uh, looking into oil futures as some of my friends. So other than the fact that I know that I still have to pay, a, you know, a couple bucks a liter here, uh, you know, I don't really know what, what the long-term impact is going to be and wouldn't hazard a guess at that one. Money? Oil futures are not okay more. Yeah, <laughs> the same. Um, you know, the only speculation that I could make would be around, you know, the availability of capital from the Middle East. Um, but, you know, too early to tell. And for what it's worth, Sandy, I had a call with some guys in Dubai, and apparently, at least at the VC stage, capital's still moving there. Yeah, there's a, there's still a whole lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I think I think obviously the the oil, the oil price thing is obviously a quite a lot to do with. There's not enough places to store it, so people have to pay to store it, pay ridiculous prices to store the oil they're producing, um, and that's partly to do with it. But it's interesting the kind of linkage between. Uh, so I think oil demand's down 25, 30 percent. If I'm right in saying, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I wonder whether, as a kind of final question before we answer the questions from uh, the audience, whether there's a comment on um, the current lockdown impact on climate change, uh, clean air, clean water, which is where we are now. I think that's the first time I've seen the other side of Edinburgh from here since we moved in, uh, and I'm sure it's a lot of. Uh, I think there's one place in China where it's the first time they've seen the Himalayas for 30, for 30 years. Who wants to pick that up, Robert? Um, yeah, just before I do that, I mean, I think just to your last point, your last question on the oil price, I, I do see that it's um, somebody that's flits backwards and forwards between the two continents. The uh, ex- exchange rate, I think, um, has, has been a little bit wobbly. And of course, that is affected by the oil price. And I think for... Uh, mm. Unlike Sandy's investments, a lot of our investments are in hardware, more about 45% of our investments in hardware sector. And so when you've got manufacturing supply chains, they do get heavily affected uh, by uh, exchange rates. And so that's something of concern for our existing portfolio. Um, on climate change, ooh. So, um, hmm. so from my perspective, these are kind of long-term sort of uh, trends. And I, again, from a futurist perspective, and I think the real interesting things, um, well, assuming that we don't, we aren't locked up for a very long, long time, uh, will be, you know, obviously the emergence of, um, you know, driverless cars, um, obviously more back to my point on 
um, new logistics systems for deliveries uh, whereby people just don't use their cars so much and don't through these kinds of technologies we're on now need to they need to travel quite so much and don't want to do that and that you know i think people will feel that the period that we've just had was a very effective or may be a very heavily concentrated period of doing business learning new ways of doing business becoming more effective we won't want to travel um, won't need to travel quite so much long term and that will of course have a a positive benefit on the economy um, and on the um, and on obviously the um, sorry the, um, the climate change. I don't want to get back into the medical side because everybody will fall asleep but obviously there is a, a big change in that area area too. Chris, Monique, um, Silicon Valley view of that? I think the one thing that people are and this is sort of the optimist view I would say is you know, climate, climate change, we were starting to get into this, you know, climate tech and clean energy tech. And it's, you know, some people were looking at it, some people weren't. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that I've spoken to who are at least hopeful that the failure we had with pandemic planning, which is 20 years of people saying, hey, we need to plan for this because it's going to happen. And then it happened, may have an impact broadly around how we, we view climate change, right? Okay. This is another thing that, that is about to happen. Uh, there was a, a billboard that uh, I saw some photos of in LA that, that you may have seen on, on social media in the past few days that effectively said something along the lines of every disaster movie starts with somebody ignoring a scientist, right? So the optimist view is, hey, maybe we'll actually pay a little bit of attention to this and, and sort of the, the investor viewpoint means, hey, you know what? Maybe this will start pushing ahead at a, at a, higher, a higher pace than it has been. Money? Yeah, I think that, you know, even over the last year or so, I've seen more investors being willing to invest in, in climate change. And I think that that number is only going to accelerate as we, you know, go, go deeper into and then hopefully come out of the pandemic. Um, you know, I think that there are still a woefully small number of investors who really understand what we should be investing in. And so I think it's going to require um, a lot of investors to get smarter on the category before you see, um, you, you see them truly accelerate deal pace. So, hmm. but I, I, think it's, I think it's going to happen. I think you can only look at, you know, you can look at LA and notice that now you're not seeing that, layer, that top layer of smog, right? And you can look at all of the, um, you know, returning to the earth memes that are that are happening out there and see the effects of humans sitting down and leaving the earth alone <laughs> yeah sandy what do you think thanks, uh, thanks Monique. i mean i think the uh um you know there are certain things like you know the airlines when you look at the the, the kind of back to your oil price versus uh, uh not having a business to run at the moment and things that run in such thin margins um, I think, you know, but, but with huge OPEX and, and, and massive CAPEX kind of the things, we're going to end up with a, you know, it looks like about three or four different national airlines. Um, uh, uh, and it's like, what capacity do we need to keep um, to keep us going kind of thing? But, you know, clearly their, their models are being stressed um, to help, which frankly, you know, it probably needed something like this to, to, to really push us to, to that point to look at this stuff. So there is an opportunity to, um, back to kind of, you know, um, Mark Andreessen's point, you know, what are we going to build? What infrastructure are we going to build? What are we going to put our money into? I'm less bullish on autonomy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm bullish on autonomous drones. I'm less bullish on trying to keep the pattern of cars that drive us to places. Um, but, uh, uh, um, and I think a lot of investors have moved, are getting, you know, they're not that happy uh, in, traditional kind of autonomy of, of cars if, if you take that pattern. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I think uh, we, looked at, we looked really hard at something recently in the kind of whole um, circular economy piece, which was a um, thinly veiled blockchain thing, which again, it had all the nice kind of buzzwords of what to do with it. But actually, it was a really interesting take on um, uh, finding ways for um, uh, re resale and everybody to participate in resale um, uh, and and if you look at the kind of macros again on things like that I think 
you know, I mean, some of the stats when I was looking at that, that, you know, the textile industry um, is actually a, a worse polluter or second worst to airlines worldwide in terms of, so there's, there's a whole load of stuff that we're doing um, that's not good that needs looking at. Um, and, you know, and that's, a, so I think we wouldn't go out and say, right, now we're going to go and do renewables. Now we're going to go and look at things like that. But certainly we're, we're more uh, attuned to looking for things that are going to be in that kind of direction of, of, of less, uh, you know, less footprint on the planet, I think is, is, is definitely, I mean, ESG was actually, if you looked at every investor deck, ESG was, was starting to, you know, certainly if anybody going to LPs, mm. what's your ESG policy? What's your ESG policy? Yeah. Um, and so environment as part as that, the E and, and uh, ESG, I think uh, uh, is definitely, it was getting important and I think it's going to get more important. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Alice, you, you've, uh, you, you have quite a bit of focus on ESG across things you've done in, over the time. Uh, what's your view? Yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things um, that actually spreads across all sectors will be there's the reset in terms of expectations around how long things take. So we've seen lots of examples where people have done things in what is incredibly short periods of time. So I think if you look at the targets around and mitigating climate change and, and getting into more sustainable um, forms of transportation or energy or these things, you know, going carbon neutral by 2050, you know, suddenly that seems like an awfully long time. Um, when you see what, when people apply themselves con you know, consistently and, and in numbers to a problem, you can actually make a much, much bigger difference. So I think there's an interesting opportunity around that in terms of if people focus their efforts can you actually start to bring some of those targets a lot, lot closer? Um, and I think, you know, you, you've seen that in, in the healthcare sector as well. Uh, you know, things happening just much more quickly. So I think that, that could be one of the, the systemic effects of what we're seeing now is that it's kind of a reset on, well, of course that takes 30 years. Well, no, it doesn't have to take 30 years. Hmm. That's a really interesting point, Alastair. And, uh, and I think that certainly from my observation, one of the things that the current situation has created the ability for management teams and leadership to move at pace and even governments to move at pace, which, which yeah. actually before this happened would be unbelievable. Uh, in fact, nobody would, if, if you'd have said to somebody in February that by uh, the middle of, uh, I think, yeah, early, early April, the UK government would have, would have given 8% salaries on furloughed staff, you'd have laughed. There, there's no way you would have Absolutely. thought that would have been. Yeah at all possible um uh so we so we're, we're we're just a bit over an hour uh now um, it's been a great discussion and thank panelists for, for the time on this jude are, are there any particular questions you want to you want to bring up before we close off i think this one from um julie grieve what metric metrics are investors looking for right now other than revenue let's have a let's have a uh, an answer from each side of the pond do you yeah. want to go first, Chris Money? Uh, sure, I'll say burn, right? So are you profitable? Are you not? How long are you going to live if you don't get external capital? Yeah, big plus one on burn rates. Um, I would also say um, looking at customer acquisition costs, have they gone up or have they gone down um, in the current climate? And how will that sustain over time? Um, so being able to clearly express how you're acquiring customers, what your acquisition costs are, what your payback period is, LTV, those sorts of, of Sandy, Alistair? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly the same. I mean, I think the, 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 I mean, the metrics that you're always looking for are what are the ones that actually prove you've got a relevance in your market, whether that's kind of standard SASH, the, uh, uh, vocabulary and grammar of LTV, CAC, blah, 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 or whether it's logos. Um, it's like, it really is. Um, so how long have you got, how long's your, 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 how long's your runway? Um, what's your burn? And how do you create re relevance for your, your business? Um, uh, it's always been the same, but I think the, the one that's, that's been heightened has been that is this, can you go, you know, 12, depending on the appetite of the investor, can you go 12, 18 or 24 months? under the, the steam of how much you're trying to raise. Yeah, I, I think just kind of echoing what Bill was saying, unit economics is, is fundamentally important. 
So that relationship between how much it costs you to get a customer and, and how much you can make, um, you know, that also plays into gross margin. Um, I think, uh, you know, although the expectation is that it may take longer to to um, generate revenue from customers, actually customer acquisition costs are going down right now. You know, if you look at advertising costs on Facebook, they've gone down 50% in the last 30 days. So, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for founders to look at, you know, what can they test really quickly um, so they can learn and they can use that. But I think, you know, would pretty much concur with, with what the others are saying in terms of you know, the fundamentals around unit economics. And um, the other one for me is, how can you demonstrate that you've got the ability to flex your plan? So because it's such an unpredictable situation, you know, if you don't hit your revenue numbers, what are you going to do to preserve that runway? So what are the changes you can make? So those would be the ones for me. Cool. Robert, any... um, yeah, so I mean, just again, just um, as a foil to some of the software investors on the, on the, on the call, um, again, PAR has a lot of hardware companies. And so for us, the supply chain is, is an issue. So I would, you know, we do look and are very cognizant of, you know, the impact uh, of C19 on supply chain, where a lot of product and components are coming out of China and are being assembled in different parts of the world. And on the backside of the supply chain, how are you going to deliver those products into the market, the logistics around it, you know, where you've got um, uh, areas of distancing that you have to take account of. So that whole supply chain it's just become a lot more complicated and volatile. So that answers yeah. um, Dr. Poonam's question as well around PP and the supply chain and stuff from China. So yeah. perfect. I knew you were the right man for that, Robert. There you go. Fantastic. Well, do, do we have any other burning questions? or? No, that's we... it. Um, yeah, anything uh, else, if people have anything over the weekend they want to ask and stuff, you can email myself or you can email into info at SBRC and we can then pass it out to the speakers. Um, but again, I'll let Paul close it off, but I'm overwhelmed by the support from the VCs here and also from Monique and Chris as well, that they, they work effortlessly, effortlessly to keep that um, connection going with Scotland and stuff like that as well. And I think that's really important going forward because we can all concentrate on, on COVID and post-COVID and stuff like that. But we did make huge inroads in the last few years to keep ourselves above the parapet and to, and to start building um, relationships and stuff like that with people outside of Scotland. So let's not forget about that in the next few months and stuff and keep that those conversations going. Um, so over to Paul. Yeah, thanks, Jude. Uh, Chris, I'm really jealous of your ski slopes in the background. <laughs> I'm particularly jealous of Monique's beach in the background. Uh, thank you much, very much for dragging yourself off the ski slope and the beach to come and talk to us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I know you've got the rest of the day ahead of you over there. Uh, we're now into uh, opening a glass of wine or a uh, uh, or a beverage of some kind into the evening and uh, beautiful sunshine here in Edinburgh. Um, and thanks to the rest of the panelists. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, thanks, Alistair. Thanks, Robert and Jude. You're what welcome. can I say? Thank you ever so much for making this possible again on a Friday afternoon and hope all of the people on the call have a brilliant weekend and, uh, and enjoy the sunshine, which is, I believe, what we're going to get this weekend. Thanks. Thanks, folks. That's everybody. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.